<clears throat> All right, in chapter 9, um, this is the last chapter that we're going to talk about um, for now. <coughs> and it is uh, on allocation, translocation, and partitioning of photoassimilates. So this basically comes on the heels of talking about photosynthesis. And uh, so the product, uh, uh, the main product of photosynthesis here being uh, G3P, uh, which is <coughs> then going to be basically converted into a variety of um, carbon compounds and transported or translocated throughout the plant. So we have some terminology to, to look at in the title of this um, chapter here, but it's all basically geared towards what happens to the product of the Calvin cycle or to the product of photosynthesis. Uh, which is this three carbon compound. So allocation is basically defined as the conversion of photoassimilates into starch or sucrose. Um, and those two um, <coughs> synthesis of starch or sucrose are actually competing <coughs> depending on the needs of the plant. So this term here means conversion of photoassimilates, which is the G3P. into starch versus sucrose. And those are the two main things, but there are other um, possible products uh, as well. So if we just kind of look back at this figure that we've been looking at before, here's G3P being exported to the cytosol. Um, and well, actually before it gets exported, uh, the one possible fate is that it um, gets converted into starch and when it does so, we're linking, it's linking um, glucose molecules all together. So there's a series of steps here, um, which is for storage. And there are actual starch granules that build up inside the chloroplast. And this does require um, energy. <coughs> so that is an energy cost um, to the plant as well. Um, if G3P is exported into the cytosol, then <coughs> It can produce starch, but the main thing we're looking at is here is this at the synthesis of sucrose, and this does require some energy as well. Um, and uh, in addition, we can see the synthesis of glucose resulting here. We just have to get rid of that phosphate group. Um, the synthesis of uh, let's see fructose here. We just have to get rid of that phosphate group, um, and. So if we look over here on the right, then we can see that um, car carbon partitioning is going to be sort of what is the idea of what happens to all, all of these potential um, products that are where carbon is allocated. So allocation refers to the actual compound that's produced. Partitioning refers to um, the distribution of these photo assimilates. The distribution of photo assimilates, such as to roots, to new leaf growth, uh, perhaps to fruits or flowers, uh, perhaps to metabolism you know, um, cellular metabolism, cellular uh, respiration rather. Um, and so that's what partitioning refers to. To transport those carbon products to these different uh, organs, these different plant organs, then these photoassimilates have to be translocated. So translocation refers to the actual movement of photoassimilates to different plant organs. Plant organs. Okay. So over here we again once again see where G3P um, can possibly be converted to starch for storage. Um, and this might happen, say, in the roots, um, as an example. Um, it can also happen in stems or in leaves. It may uh, be that glucose or fructose is the product, it's the, it's the um, photoassimilate that's um, produced, and this is useful for, for energy needs or metabolism. And finally, uh, sucrose 
uh, which is then shuttled to other areas, which means that it is transported in phloem. And that's what we're going to mainly concentrate here. But by being, this is, so sucrose is that translocatable form, and the phloem can take then the sucrose to wherever the partitioning is, is um, prioritized. So to, as we said above, up in here, um, to roots, uh, to new growth, oops, to new growth, um, to, for reproductive purposes, uh, fr fruits and flowers, perhaps partitioning or um, it, it is towards secondar secondary metabolism, and that's the production of tannins or phenols, uh, nicotine, caffeine, these are all secondary metabolites that are um, uh, this result, this might refer more to allocation and perhaps then where it's, you know, which follows where it's produced um, or converted into these um, different compounds. But secondary metabolism is useful for deterring herbivory, uh, making the, the food taste, uh, taste bad, the unpalatability of, of leaves, or um, making it harder for the organism to digest proteins. So we're looking at things like phenols, tannins, lignin, nicotine, and so forth. So allocation to, to starch versus sucrose is always in competition. Competition. Um, depending on the plant's need, uh, the plant's need is determined by the partitioning, the pressure for different um, places to partition the carbon uh, that is just synthesized. And again, translocation is, is getting those photo assimilates to those different areas for the plant to partition that carbon. All right, so going on with our, dis um, carrying on with our discussion about uh, sucrose and the movement through phloem, we see this diagram here on the left, uh, which shows us how water moves um, up through xylem, it's taken up by the soil, from the soil, by the roots, moving up through xylem towards the leaves, and then, um, let's make this a little bit bigger, then um, transpiration is driving the movement of um, water out into the atmosphere. Uh, and it's, of course, driven by evaporation. Evaporation driven, OK. Um, and then we can also see over here on the other side, uh, photosynthesis has resulted in the fixation of CO2 into sucrose, and then sucrose can be transported here following the, the black line through phloem. Uh, and it's just showing here going down towards the roots. And of course, those, these photo assimilates can be allocated towards the roots um, or partitioned into the roots uh, for, for things like growth or for storage or even for exudates. So remember back when we were talking about um, nutrients and plant roots, that the roots actually exude a um, sugary, sticky, uh, carbohydrate-rich fluid um, that, that around the root to attract bacteria and fungi, which then sort of creates that rhizosphere. So lots of reasons why carbon would be partitioned into the roots. Uh, but, but it gets there through phloem. Now, as I said, this is sort of showing one direction, but you can have bi-directional movement of um, of sucrose through phloem, perhaps this storage component of the roots is then going to release um, the, the uh, stored sugars and be transporting it, or um, basically that the, uh, those sugars can be transported to, say in spring, to areas of new growth or to fruits and so forth. Well, spring would be probably areas of new growth or to flowers. Some, some plants, some trees flower before they grow in the spring. Um, so we would see these arrows pointing in the opposite direction. Um, but as long as the photo assimilates are moving through separate flow and vessels, then they can, uh, there can be bidirectional transport. All right, so sucrose moves through phloem. And how do we know that? Well, we're looking at an, an insect over here called an aphid. And this aphid here has a stylus that um, pierces through the epidermis and into the mesophyll um, 
in and into the phloem. And you can see from the diagram, the stylus is like this sort of um, needle-like um, mouth part. And once it pierces that phloem, then the, the phloem sap will flow through the aphid at such, and, and apparently at a high pressure, um, such that you can see a droplet of phloem sap um, exuding from the other end of the, the aphid. So this is how we know that phloem sap is under positive pressure. Um, and then we also can take this phloem sap, they, they've cut the um, aphid off at the stylus here and left it sort of attached to the leaf and you can see the phloem sap exuding here. So then they're taking this phloem sap and uh, analyzing the contents and um, have found that photo assimilates, whoops, pH, such as sucrose and other um, organic compounds are found in this in, as components of this sap. So they're contained in the phloem sap. Okay. So phloem sap is under positive pressure. And so that leads us to a discussion here on the mechanism for phloem transport. So the pressure flow hypothesis explains um, a mechanism for the movement of phloem sap. And so we're looking at phloem over here and we're looking at xylem over here. And um, we already saw that phloem is under <coughs> positive pressure and phloem sap flows from, this hypothesis basically um, states that phloem sap moves from a source to a sink. <coughs> now a source can be say a mesophyll cell where photoassimilates were just produced from photosynthesis um, but it could also be a root let's say that was storing photoassimilates as starch but in any case it's where the, the uh, sucrose is going to be coming from and then the sink is going to be the receiving end so perhaps roots um, for storage might be a, a sink storage starch storage, um, perhaps growing uh, bud uh, leaves and uh, essentially new buds. <coughs> um, let's say fruits, flowers, these are all good examples of sinks. So the source end is always under a high hydrostatic pressure the source end of flow, and we should say. And this uh, flow and sap is moving from the source with high hydrostatic pressure to sinks with low hydrostatic pressure. So flow and sap moves down a pressure gradient. So if we start with the first side here, we can see that uh, we're looking at a mesophyll cell, for, for example, and this is a, a source uh, uh, cell where sucrose has just been produced by photosynthesis. It's uh, going to either be diffusing through or uh, actively transported into a sieve tube member or element, uh, which is one the component of phloem that transports phloem sap. All right. So as the sugars, the sucrose enters the phloem um, source end of the phloem, you can see that the right here negative 1.7 the 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 um, osmotic potential is uh, dropping, is low. Now we're comparing that osmotic potential with over here with xylem, which has a pretty high osmotic potential. There are not many um, uh, mole sugar molecules or other solutes that are dissolved in, in xylem sap. Um, also remember the xylem is dead, vessel elements are dead, so they always have a negative uh, pressure potential associated with it. Sieve tube elements are living, so they have a positive pressure potential associated with it. Um, and then ultimately we're looking at the water potential here, negative 1.1 compared to the nearby xylem at negative uh, 0.8. So the xylem water potential is actually higher than the nearby um, source end of the phloem. 
So we'll continue with phloem sap movement through phloem next.